Um, yeah, so I'll get started then. Uh, my name's Cam Nugent. Uh, so I'm actually a PhD student in bioinformatics at the University of Guelph. Um, and you might be wondering why is he talking to us about financial stuff? And this is what I like to do on my coffee breaks. And I wanted a, a break from what I usually present about. So I'm talking today about gathering stock data in Python and sort of the changing landscape in the past year um, due to the demise and rebirth of Yahoo Finance. So uh, stock data within Python, this is something, uh, there's a lot of libraries out there uh, that can help you acquire it. And um, it's great for obviously the really uh, standard things one would use. You could do some sort of modeling stuff. I personally, I like to generate these graphs and send them to myself every morning via email. Um, I have Python doing that automatically for me. And that way I know how much money I lost yesterday. So that's always useful information to have. Um, but I'd also like to posit to you guys that um, financial data, uh, specifically historical financial data, this is a really useful teaching tool um, when it comes to using, um, teaching people about the basis of uh, how to use pandas. Um, you can teach them about visualizing time series. Um, and you can use it as a really good starting point for some introductory statistics. Um, just to, for those of you not familiar, this is like a standard sort of data frame I'd be talking about, um, historical stock data. As you see, you can have an index built on date times, various floating point numbers, uh, discussing the high and lows throughout the day, and you can look at how those are changing over time. Um, and this is really good teaching material. Um, and I'm not the first person to think that. And indeed, there's a lot of uh, really well-known textbooks out there that uh, some of you might have encountered. Uh, obviously, uh, Python for Finance is one. Um, and another is um, one of my favorite textbooks was uh, Python for Data, Data Analysis by Wes McKinney. Um, and you'll notice here, there's a common theme that uh, both of those, those are examples straight from the textbooks. So these are used within the chapters to teach people uh, data frame um, or uh, statistical fundamentals. And they're both relying on the Yahoo Finance API in the background. Um, so this was, uh, that's about as set in stone as you can get when it's written down into a nice big textbook that's thought to be a method that doesn't really change until it does, which happened um, back on May 18th of this year. Uh, Yahoo, uh, out of the blue, just sort of turned their API off. So all these nice data you could query um, using Pandas Data Reader and some of these other modules, um, they uh, got turned off. Um, and this was about one month prior to their acquisition by Verizon. Uh, so people thought that they might be moving towards a monetization of this service. Um, and a lot of those uh, libraries, including the ones I just showed you, uh, there was immediate loss of functionality. Um, so all these nice uh, textbook examples, if you were working through these textbooks um, in uh, May of this year, you would have found that the basis of the examples just started throwing a bunch of errors, which is not really good. And uh, people such as myself who had code based, uh, built on top of these libraries and that was running automatically, these things, uh, they just sort of uh, started breaking. Um, indeed, some of you might know that uh, Python for data analysis, uh, they put out a second edition of it back in October. Um, and the way they addressed this issue, um, I guess they were pretty bearish on the return of Yahoo Finance. So this was actually moved uh, to a supplementary CSV file. So they just sort of hard coded in the CSV and sh uh, shipped that. And that was their workaround for uh, getting through that now broken example, um, which works, but I think there's a, there's a loss of what you're teaching people when you do that in terms of how to dynamically gather data and interact with an API. I think those are important things that we're taught and they're sort of out of the way with that. Um, so with the Yahoo Finance no longer working, uh, various people out there, myself included, started coming up with some uh, custom fixes for it. Um, so. I actually went for a really, really um, ugly thing, which was to just go and scrape it off of the, um, the HTML from the Yahoo website. Um, and some other people had ways that you could sort of patch in um, and use Panda's uh, data reader, even though the Yahoo Finance API was down. Um, so I've mentioned it a few times now, uh, Panda's data reader, uh, this was written into the initial build of Pandas and has been split off into a separate entity at this point. Um, and it's maintained uh, via GitHub in an open source setting. And, and there are redundancies built into its functionality. So not only can you get data from Yahoo Finance, but they also, they have uh, numerous other data sources besides just historical stock data. But for our purposes, you can also use, um, in the background, use Quandl or things like Google Finance, which is a, a great spot, but that's sort of been in a perpetual beta and it's constantly being updated and changing. 
Another uh, solution that I adopted was using uh, the IEX, which stands for the Investors Exchange. Uh, so this is, um, if any of you have ever read the book Flash Boys by Michael Lewis, that's actually the uh, exchange that was developed um, by the protagonist of that book in response to uh, high frequency traders. And one of the things that they did was they um, try to make data freely available to everyone. So they have a nice uh, API that will return historical data in a great JSON format that you can use. Um, all of these solutions, um, they do work well, but there is a certain gap. And I think that's an important gap to address here, seeing as we're at PyCon Canada. And that is that they're focusing um, on American stock markets. So if you're looking at stocks that are on the NYSE, which um, for some people's uses is great, they're well supported. Um, but for people such as myself, who were trying to query data off of uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange, uh, maybe you're interested in data from different uh, exchanges around the world, um, these methods fall short. So um, there are stock markets outside of the US, and a lot of us need to use them. So although Google Finance and Quandl were still supported, this did cause a lot of gnashing of teeth for those of us up here in Canada, and for reasons other than just the usual losing money on the stock market. Um, for now, this story does have a happy ending, and that is, is that um, Yahoo Finance has been reactivated in a different format than it initially was. If any of you are using Pandas Data Reader, upgrade it and your, uh, your code will start to work again. Um, another great thing that I think is important to address is the uh, redundancy in information sources. Um, so uh, currently this is the, uh, the default way you can read data and you see by just subbing in one single string there from Google to Quandl or Yahoo, you can go through and you can acquire data from these different sources. Um, so you could, uh, you can, if there is an issue with one of those, you can quickly and easily pivot to the use of a different data source as a temporary fix. And with Yahoo Finance back on, it does address that shortcoming in the market that I was talking about, um, which is that it does let you um, acquire data from international sources. So um, personally, I use this to get information about uh, Toronto Stock Exchange, but you can also use it for uh, markets all throughout Europe and Asia, which is a really great functionality and makes it more generalized a little and uh, international. Um, the point of this story is that there's a lesson, lesson learned here, and that is that uh, online data sources are not permanent. Um, and if you're relying on other people's APIs, uh, you should be prepared for them to work differently or think about the chances that they might not exist in their current form. So it's always good to have a backup plan. That's where redundant sources of information uh, come into play. You might not have to be using them actively day to day, but it's good to think about where else could I be acquiring this data from? And then you can quickly uh, pivot if the, need be, uh, if the need comes up. And sometimes there'll be uh, temporary uh, short-term situations where you might have to uh, sort of develop your own quick and dirty solutions. Um, and one of the other things is that hopefully there'll be continued community support. I'd like to give a big shout out to the team who works on Pandas Data Reader. Um, they keep this service up and running, even though the ground is shifting up beneath their feet and these APIs have changed. Um, they've done a great job of making sure that that code still works and it provides a dynamic form of uh, interacting with, with these markets without having to rely on just uh, old web scraping techniques and things like that. So it's important to adapt, adapt with changes um, and hopefully uh, these free services that exist, um, they'll continue to expand I know that's wishful thinking, but hopefully there can be free data available for all of us. Um, and I'd just like to close by saying thank you. I appreciate you all coming. And uh, yeah, look me up on the internet. <laughs>
Uh, no, uh, yeah. So yeah, you don't want to be doing high frequency trading off 20 minute delay data. That's for sure. <laughs> Um, the one I was just talking about is daily, but uh, Yahoo Finance, there are, um, you can get down to, I believe, the minute. Um, and if you go through on the investors exchange, um, you can get down to an even higher resolution than that, as far as I know. Yeah. So different sources will allow you to do different things with them. So, yeah. Nice, we actually got a question. <laughs> I'm hanging out if you guys just want to come say hi afterwards, too. So, thank you.